Hello, you're listening to Kopi Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tim Rubek, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 51st episode. We live and work in Asia, and we have a naturally positive predisposition toward this continent. After all, Asia accounts for 55% of the world's population and contributes about 60% of global growth. And this is not a recent phenomenon. For over 30 years, the region has consistently accounted for the bulk of global growth. It is aided by two giants, China and India, and it has dynamic ASEAN and North Asia along the way. So the region's scale, pools of savings, excellence in trade and commerce and technology, all of these appear to point to rather bright years and decades ahead. But perhaps this is too rosy and simplistic. To get a reality check on this view, we have with us today Vasuki Shastri, Associate Fellow in the Asia-Pacific Program of Chatham House. He is a former journalist and has worked at the International Monetary Fund, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the Standard Chartered Bank. Shastri is the author of two books on Asia, Research in Indonesia from Crisis to Confidence, and a new one, Has Asia Lost It? Dynamic Past, Turbulent Future. Well, we're definitely going to talk about that book today. Vasuki Shastri, welcome to Kopi Time. Thanks for having me, Taimur. It's a pleasure. And, you know, your book is an excellent uh, reality check uh, for those of us in Asia. Uh, the uh, uh, rear blurb of your book, uh, Bilahari Kaushikan says that Shastri provides a timely corrective exposing the many complexities of Asia. So I, I want to spend the next 30, 40, 50 minutes, hopefully, uh, talking to you about some of those complexities and, and see if you can actually give us some glimmer of hope toward the end. But Vasuki, I'd like to begin uh, from the very early part of your book. Um, in the uh, first chapter, or perhaps in the end of the uh, forward, you say that uh, typically rosy long-term forecasts are characteristics of analysts who follow Asia. Uh, so what has been the track record of forecasters of Asia in the past couple of decades? Uh, yes, I think that's a very, very good place to start because if you go back to the 1950s and you look at you look at all the economic analysis at that time. In the book, I quote uh, Gunnar Merdel, the famous Swedish uh, economist, you know, who who played a very, very big role in India's uh, development journey at that time, and and even someone who really was attuned uh, to the challenges of the developing world. I mean, he wrote in 1957 uh, that, you know, the, the West really had uh, figured out a pattern of uh, development and would remain developed for a long period of time. And uh, he said there would be many, many other countries in the developing world. And, you know, he was primarily referring to South Asia at the time, who would find it extremely challenging uh, uh, to, to really go, grow up the economic value chain. And, you know, looking back, uh, and I think 1950s, you had a lot of prognostication about Asia's dismal future. You know, a lot of people were worried about South Korea. I mean, this is pretty laughable looking back uh, 60, 70 years uh, that people were worrying about South, Asia, uh, South Korea's economic prospects. I mean, indeed, South Korea's uh, per capita GDP at that point in time was lower than that of Ghana. Uh, so I think the first uh, big fallacy uh, by the economics community was really underestimating the grit and the determination of Japan and the Asian Tigers. And, you know, that that Asian miracle uh, is still astounding uh, to, to look back on, mainly because of where the region was coming from, uh, because of the absolutely bold uh, uh, steps that the leaders of the time took, really looking at, uh, uh, looking at Asia's own lack of self-sufficiency. Uh, they focused on uh, globalization, trade, and investment, and and that big bet really paid off handsomely. You know, forecasters were behind the curve on that. Now, coming to the 1990s, and this is a period I'm very familiar with because I was a journalist in Singapore and Indonesia at that time, where we went through this five-year period in the early 1990s when everyone was talking about Asia's time had come, that Southeast Asia would be fully developed by 2020. And of course, you will remember Paul Krugman's uh, famous or infamous paper from 1994, uh, where he posited that uh, much of East Asia's economic growth 
could be explained away by perspiration uh, rather than inspiration. That it had a lot right. to do with uh, labor uh, rather than capital. Now, I think Asia has come a long way since then. We've, we've got, uh, uh, of course, the rise of China to factor in. We've got the rise of India to factor in. I mean, I, w- I would say India to a more limited extent compared with uh, China. So the forecaster's fallacy really is looking at existing economic growth conditions and, and extrapolating that to 20, 30 years. And you know, in the book, I cite an IMF economist, Prakash Lungani, who's done a lot of work on short-term forecasting, uh, really looking at economics professions' ability to forecast recessions, which are really short-term in nature. And, and the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, uh, that the profession has not been able to capture, you know, the the complexity in in predicting uh, even short term recessions. So if you discount what the eco- what economists have to say about the short term, I would say, you know, looking at ADB forecasts or any other organization's forecast, 30, 40, 50 years down the line that Asia is going to be fully developed, I would take with a pinch of salt. Masuki, even shorter term. Uh, so last night I was thinking about that part in your book and I decided to download some data and I found the April 2010 IMF World Economic Outlook and the April 2015 World Economic Outlook because they tend to contain five-year uh, forward uh, projections. And it's remarkable, even in those two instances, 2010 and 2015, uh, the, A, there was a lot of error uh, when you look back and B, the errors were all one-sided as in they were all too optimistic. And I'm talking about forecasts for China, forecasts for India, et cetera. So I'm not even talking about the 2020 blip, which of course is, you know, nobody can see that. But even before that, the last decade, uh, the the points that you have made a hold for the the recent years as well, uh, even after Prakash had written his papers about the one-way tracking errors and forecasting in his organization. Um, So, okay, fair enough that, you know, we, don't have a very good track record. And it seems like, you know, if some place does well in the recent past, we tend to sort of extrapolate that. And I think the reason you bring this up is because you think that um, realistic projections and recognition of challenges uh, is important. And that theme, I suppose, runs through the entire gamut of the chapters that you have. I think you bring this in very nicely again in chapter one, when you talk about a peer in your school uh, and you say, quote, he was numb by praise in his youth and insufficiently challenged. So I want to ask you to sort of project that in the context of Asia, that do you think Asia's experience in the past few decades similar, that the region hasn't really been challenged by uh, uh, the, the various, uh, uh, by either forecasters or their own population, and that everybody's sort of cheering the region on? Yeah, I think you know, Asia really suffers from this smart student syndrome, where, you know, you ask anyone in London or the US about Asia, they, you know, they tend to talk in terms of uh, how wonderful and dynamic the region is. And indeed, you know, Asia has got a lot to be proud about. Dynamism has really powered uh, the global economy over the last few years. But if you look beyond economics, and that that really is the uh, uh, focus of the book, but if you just focus on economic growth and, and you know, if you focus on per capita GDP, uh, you're going to end up feeling very, very good about Asia's economic prospects. But if you move away from the intellectual and thought leadership bubble, and when you try to spend some time uh, with, you know, uh, 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 with auto rickshaw driver in Mumbai, as I did, who really gave me, it was a really chasing experience uh, listening to this driver describe how he was not benefiting from India's rapid economic growth over the last decade. And so when we tend to think of China, you know, there's there's a sense of elite capture, I think, where the people who write about Asia's economic uh, prospects, both within the region and globally, tend to be, you know, uh, business community, uh, academics, uh, think tanks, and, and they all tend to agree with each other violently. Uh, that Asia is the region uh, which is going to take over. But when you begin to have conversations outside of this bubble, and this is what I tried to do in the last four or five years, you come back with a less hopeful future, mainly because you're seeing two things. And, and you know, the first thing is, of course, rising inequality. And, and it must be said that inequality is not 
a uniquely Asian phenomenon. Uh, certainly the US and, and Europe also faces great challenges uh, dealing with inequality. But the thing that worries me more is uh, social mobility. And you know, you and I belong to a generation where we really benefited from uh, from the simple fact. And the, the proposition that I think Asian leaders uh, had in mind in the 1960s and 1970s was successive generations had to do better than their parents. And I, I think you know, I can I can realistically look at my uh, uh, life path and say, uh, thanks to all the opportunities offered uh, through education, through job opportunities, I certainly have done extremely well. I can't say this is going to be the same case uh, with the generation that we have today. And if Asian policymakers really need to be really need to worry about one one thing, I would say it's social mobility. And you know, just dis- dis- disregard the praise uh, that we receive uh, from the business community, from from uh, uh, think tanks and such, uh, mainly because all the action, and we've seen some of this action already, farmers' agitation in India, the, the protests in Thailand, the protests in Hong Kong, that this is going to manifest itself in in the social political arena, rather rather than just in economics. Absolutely. And Rizuki, uh, you talk about dystopian Asia, one of the phrases that you use in your book. And I think the, the, the rickshaw uh, driver that you're talking about, Pramod, who you bring up toward the end of your book as well, uh, I think sort of gives you that uh, perspective very clearly that, you know, you have this veneer of fancy cars and gleaming towers, but the people who are driving the cars and waiting outside when they're bosses are whining and dining, uh, their lives are characterized by very flat or zero social mobility. Uh, I finished reading Arvind Adiga's uh, White Tiger, which now has been made into a movie. Similarly, I I see that. But there are other phrases that you use in your book. One is utopian Asia, and the other is Asia-phoria. So can you talk about those two phrases? Yeah, you know, when I started writing the book, and you know, Bilahari mentions in the in the book endorsement that Asia is an abstraction. And I completely agree with him. And I think it's useful to unpack what Asia we are referring to. And you know, I'd, I'd say the Asia that you are living in, Taimur, in Singapore, or advanced uh, uh, high-income Singapore, along with the other tigers, along with uh, Japan. So developed Asia is something that we should not worry about. Developed Asia has the resources, has the leadership, to really navigate uh, the, uh, uh, the, the challenges that are bound to come in the next few decades. Uh, the Asia that I worried about uh, in, the, in the context of the book is developing Asia, which is which you know it includes China, India, and Indonesia, three of the largest populous nations in the region. Also includes the smaller nations, you know, Nepal, uh, uh, certainly Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And all of these countries are embarking on their growth journey, and obviously they've all got unique characteristics. Uh, so when I look at this part of Asia, I, I can't help but think that the future is dystopian, uh, because even if you accept the proposition that China is well positioned to, you know, China is a high middle income country today, uh, we'll see how that transformation into high income status, whether it will take place or not, whether it's going to be challenging or not. But I think even China, you strip away the growth story and you really look at uh, uh, simple factors like, you know, uh, our college graduates able to get jobs uh, that easily compared to 10 years ago. And the answer that you come back is no. So, you know, so for me, dystopia, is what uh, uh, the reality is in many parts of developing Asia, and that's the focus of the book. Then I go on to, I mean, I must thank Larry Summers and Lance Pitchard for the phrase Asia Foria, which again come back uh, to our conversation on forecasting. And what Larry and Lance essentially say, and this is a paper that they developed for the NBER, that if you if you begin to project, if you look at current rates of economic growth, and you begin to project forward, you're bound to make mistakes. And they offer this very interesting example of Brazil, uh, which of course grew very, very rapidly in the 1980s. And the point that they make is uh, economic growth growth began to stall in Brazil 
in the late 1980s and for much of the next two decades until President Lula uh, came into power, there was no economic growth at all, right? So we should stop making these fallacies about Asia shining and uh, Asia rising and pause a bit and look at, you know, some of the dystopian features in the region and also look at the fact that even if we accept that high economic growth rates can be sustained well into the future, certainly we should focus on equity. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the And I want to talk about this since you started sort of looking at the country examples, uh, particularly in the context of China and so on. Um, I, I want to sort of start hearing a bit about your sort of country specific views. Um, now, for East Asia in particular, you know, trade and investment has been the fulcrum of their impressive performance over the last few decades. Um, you, I think, absolutely correctly, you know, assert that this cannot be taken for granted given the way the world is going. Uh, and basically, we have discussed the deglobalization narrative and uh, all uh, the inward looking mentality that we're seeing among the policymakers in the West in previous podcasts and so on. So we, we take your point on that. I just want to sort of extend that assertion in the countries that you look at. I mean, which countries do you think are the most vulnerable to the likely worsening of the trade investment environment? I mean, I think Vietnam is a striking example for me. And, and, and I contrast Vietnam with Indonesia. And if, you know, in the 1990s, Indonesia was pretty much uh, uh, Vietnam of that era in terms of a lot of low cost manufacturers had moved into the country where you had the South Korean shoe manufacturers who were all over Jakarta at that point in time. And, you know, there were, there were reasonable prospects for Indonesia that it would go up the value chain. And I must say that Vietnam has done a much better job uh, than Indonesia in really transforming itself into almost uh, a high-tech player. Vietnam is not there fully as yet. But, you know, there's this one statistic that really is startling, uh, that the Samsung factory in Vietnam has more qualified engineers on its roles uh, than they are qualified engineers in all of Indonesia. <laughs> and and this and this is really so. If, if you accept the proposition that uh, globalization, trade, and investment is going to charge ahead, then certainly Vietnam is much better positioned than Indonesia. But if you say that it's going to be domestic consumption, countries will have to really look inward because the atmosphere and the climate uh, for trade openness is not going to be conducive in the next ten years. Then you begin to look at. Uh, India and Indonesia, which in terms of dependence on trade, are at the low end of the spectrum compared with uh, Vietnam, uh, compared certainly with uh, the Asian tigers. Now, the challenge, I guess, for Vietnamese policymakers, and you know, this is a very interesting uh, 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 trend of very, very preliminary decoupling that is taking place, where a lot of the manufacturers uh, don't want to uh, uh, depend too much on China. They're beginning to hedge their bets. They're beginning to think of Vietnam as the final assembly point for uh, many of the electronics products uh, that come out of Asia. And so Vietnam is you know, bound to double down on, on securing these investments and making sure that in many aspects, it is going to be the next China. But what happens if you know the American voter, the the, uh, the the folks who voted for Brexit in the UK, they're cynical, skeptical about the value of trade, and and the pandemic has raised attention to uh, reshoring uh, for people to say that you know, all of our medical supplies should be produced within our borders. So if you look at these range of risks, uh, you you begin to worry about completely open economies such as Vietnam. And, and, you know, countries like India and Indonesia, who've got vast hinterland and got vast populations, are probably better positioned. Right. Uh, of course, it also makes uh, other open trade-oriented economies of Asia, whether it is, you know, Singapore or Taiwan or Korea, or Japan, for that matter. I mean, there's some degree of vulnerability. Of course, you're not saying all manufacturing is about to go back to British Midlands, no. but the marginal gain that one can expect 
uh, certainly would be uh, much, much less going forward. And, and of course, you know, there's the other layer beyond geopolitics is automation and 3D printing and all the other layers of technology that are coming in, which also makes sort of onshoring or producing local uh, far more feasible than it did in the 90s or 2000s, I suppose. Um, uh, Masuki, you then in your book sort of move on to the issue of productivity where you point out, and this goes back to the seminal study by Krugman back in the 90s, but others have talked about it as well, that Asia has not grown through too much total factor productivity, but more by mobilizing labor and some capital. Uh, and unless we have this whole culture of pushing for innovation and getting productivity going, it'll be very difficult to maintain high quality growth. So I just wanted to ask you where you see evidence of promising growth in Asia, if anywhere at all. And also, do you think that we're getting productivity measures right? Because I sometimes wonder, um, given all the technology that we have, why isn't there better gains in productivity? I'm going to start with the old joke that the evidence is everywhere, but in the statistics. Right. And, and I think Asia really presents a mixed picture. And you know, if you look at China 2025, uh, that clearly is uh, uh, China's gambit to to make productivity gains, to focus on automation, AI, and uh, the internet of the future. And and I guess Chinese policymakers do worry about how long they can continue with this export-led growth model. And uh, so you know, China 2025, even though it's incredibly contentious in this part of the world. I thought was a very interesting way of organizing a country, and obviously central planning works well in China, to really boost productivity growth. If you look elsewhere in the region, I mean, I, I do worry about, you know, in the context of the pandemic, of course, we've had uh, lots of people working from home. Uh, E-commerce uh, certainly has done extremely well. And But if you look at the data, uh, you, you, and, and, you know, I, I share your frustration. Uh, on whether we are measuring all of this correctly, because the data is all over the place. And, and you know, a large country like India, uh, which kind of has lost its way economically in the last few years, so, you know, Indian economy uh, fared very badly in 2020, uh, but, you know, all the problems that India faces predates the pandemic. Much, has, much of this has to do with a literally non-functioning financial system. But even in India, uh, uh, what are the productivity drivers? And, and you really come up with, at the end of the day, India is a services superpower. And, and we know for a fact that uh, the service sector is never, never going to lead in, in a dramatic way in productivity. So, right. and, and then, you know, another dimension of this, of course, if you look at Singapore and uh, Korea, where the policymakers are constantly fretting about TFP. So either we are looking, either we're going to be facing the productivity challenge with a lag that, you know, when growth does slow down, policymakers are going to realize that there's something wrong with the growth engine and need to boost productivity. Or, you know, a much more fundamental question, which is almost Krugman esque, that the current Asian economic model. Is, is not delivering the kind of productivity gains. And maybe there's something beyond uh, uh, supply chains. There's something beyond the export-led model which can deliver these gains. Right. Uh, the problem, Basuki, is that, you know, when you look around the world for an example that Asia can emulate, you know, it's not like, you know, anywhere else in the world we're seeing impressive productivity growth either. Maybe Israel is an exception. Um, so, so, no, your, your uh, point is uh, well taken. Um, it is interesting, however, though, and you know, Thomas Piketty has sort of pointed it out, looking at very long range data is that the marginal return to capital is very high, uh, which is another reason why companies are far more interested in doing share buybacks and uh, other capital market uh, engineering as opposed to doing fixed asset investment because fixed asset investment doesn't pay that much. Whereas, you know, putting money to work through IPOs and M&As somehow or the other is unlocking a lot of value for shareholders. and. CEOs. Um, so do you worry that is also the case in Asia or do you think that's more of a US European thing, this whole uh, uh, R being greater than G phenomenon? 
I think you know the, the point about fixed asset investment uh, in developing Asia. You know, so let's exclude China from this uh, for, from this equation for a moment. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a case for lifting manufacturing as a share of GDP. Uh, uh, there's a case for greater levels of capital investment than what we've seen in the last decade. Uh, but then we've come come up with this absolute barrier, and and you know. Uh, maybe developing Asian policymakers should learn a lesson or two uh, from the experience of the Tigers and, and certainly the experience of Japan. In, you know, you have Bangladesh and Cambodia at one end of the spectrum, very large uh, textile exporters. And in fact, I think Bangladesh is one of the largest textile exporters in the world today. So how does Bangladesh make that transformation from merely producing garments uh, uh, literally in batches of millions uh, because they have cheap labor, to begin to focus on branding, to begin to focus on technology, marketing, and finance. So Bangladesh on its own can can build up the Zaras and, and the Massimo Dutis of the future. And, you know, so there's that huge gap in, in many parts of developing Asia where they really see themselves as being factories of the world, and and my point is, you know, factories of the world are extremely susceptible to economic cycles. So Bangladesh may be very, very competitive today, uh, but the business could migrate to some other corner of Asia or some other part of the world if the costs begin to pile up. And then what is Bangladesh going to do in terms of boosting productivity? And, and the frustrating aspect of this, there is very little public debate on many of these issues in Asia. And I think, you know, uh, during the course of the book, I spent a lot of time uh, looking at research papers, looking at the media narrative, and it's exclusively focused on growth and not on these components. So you raise the right question on this. And I'm glad you point out, and I, I've seen in several parts of your book where you sort of rail against this obsession with growth, um, which I don't think has been very good to the environment and certainly has not been very good for equitable distribution of wealth, uh, something that I guess we should have woken up to a long time ago, but at least you know, better late than never. Uh, now, there is a rather provocative part in your book where you sort of talk about uh, the risks that we may have overinvested in cell infrastructure, and you don't quite buy the claim that ADB made, which got a lot of headlines. I think it was two years ago during the ADB meetings, then that study came out that Asia has a $2 trillion infrastructure gap. So walk us through why you're skeptical. Yeah, I think these numbers that are bandied about, and you know, it's not just the ADB, it's lots of other multilateral organizations and the private sector. And you know, ultimately, I think these are phantom numbers. I mean, if I'm sure the $2 trillion number cited by ADB is based on good economic facts. And I think you look at the infrastructure gap in Asia, you can come up with that number. If you work for a bank, Timur, you know that the fundamental question that gets asked when an infrastructure project is being financed, is it bankable? You know, is it viable uh, economically? Is it viable from a political risk perspective? Is it viable from a long-term perspective? And the discovery that I made in my uh, brief brief career in banking is it's well and good to talk about these $2 trillion, $3 trillion numbers. But when you begin to have conversations at country levels and you look at country level plans, you begin to realize, first of all, obviously, they're financing gaps uh, 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 in many of these countries. They're unable to find the money uh, to build the kind of ambitious infrastructure plans that multilateral institutions want want them to focus on. And the private sector is a reluctant participant in many of these cases, and the private sector only tends to get involved when there's some kind of first loss guarantees uh, that are right. being placed. And indeed, many of the infrastructure projects that we see being built in, in Asia today uh, has these PPPs, uh, has these first loss guarantees, some element of blended finance. And when you bring all of these factors into play, it becomes much, much more difficult uh, uh, to build infrastructure on a grand scale. And maybe China is the, large, is the last country uh, uh, which we've seen in our lifetime, which has really been able to scale up infrastructure. And I think it's a reasonable question to ask is, 
whether China has overspent on infrastructure. And that probably explains its current very high debt to GDP level. But, you know, going into India, going into Indonesia, uh, uh, you, you realize that you know, if you're a finance minister, uh, we tend to focus a lot of attention on physical infrastructure. And I think a lot of people get excited with building roads, dams, bridges. There's less focus, I think, and I think the pandemic really is teaching us a lesson. Less focus on investment in social infrastructure, mainly education and health. And I think the ratio of investment in infrastructure in Asia over the last two decades has skewed heavily in favor of transport connectivity rather than primary healthcare centers, uh, uh, rather than primary schools. So we need to reset that balance. And at the end of the day, I think if you're a developing country, you're always going to be faced with uh, 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 making your budget work, uh, setting priorities. And maybe for the next five years, Asia needs to focus on the social aspects of infrastructure rather than just the physical ones. Yeah, Vasuki, I think the opportunity to cut a ribbon and get a you know big splash in the newspapers, I think happens only with physical infrastructure. Uh, improving the quality of nurses or improving the quality of primary school education is not that catchy for the TV news in the evening. So I think that might be one of the demotivating factors. But uh, I, I take your point. So you're not a skeptic of infrastructure investment. You just want the right blend. Uh, and, uh, and and I, I see this, this obsession with you know expanding road networks and next bridge and next toll road. Uh, whereas uh, a lot of times, you know, what is connecting those toll roads are those cities thriving and do they have the, the, the soft infrastructure? I think that's what your focus is. And I think uh, when we talk about productivity, that's where the key in, input will come from, no doubt. Um, now, there are three big things that you touch on in your book, uh, deglobalization. We've talked about that a bit. And then you also talk about technological disruption, which I think you, know, you see it more as a risk to employment and, and social upheaval than the disruption sort of changing inefficiencies and putting us in a more productive plane. And then the third issue is climate change. Um, what do you think, you think these three are all unmitigated negatives or there is some opportunity around these as well? No, they're not negative at all. And I think, you know, uh, this is really a question of resetting our perspective on what kind of Asia we want in the future. And I think we all have been numbed into thinking that the Asia of today and the Asia of, of, of the last 30 years, which is incredible interconnectedness, integrated with the global economy, focused on you know trade at the expense of everything else, that Asia is going to change. And, and it'll be really completely unrealistic for a national planner or a policymaker when, when the horizon is set uh, for national planning for the next 10 years or 15 years to reasonably expect export uh, to be an engine of growth. And I think there's a lot of uh, uh, characteristics, a lot of advantages that Asia has, which it simply has not capitalized on. And you know, education, I think, is a great example. Where today, in many parts of Asia, we've got a surplus of college graduates. And I think there's disturbing evidence from other parts of the world where if you've got a surplus of college graduates who are not able to be employed or who, or who really are underemployed, uh, that is a recipe for social unrest. And I do wonder, I mean, one really must look at the evidence, this is very sketchy at the moment. Uh, I do wonder whether the lack of social mobility in Hong Kong, uh, the lack of opportunities in Thailand, and both these countries have very, very high rates of uh, college graduates, whether that is the proximate cause for the unrest that we're beginning to see. And if you look at Myanmar, that's a very, very interesting example. Obviously, a uh, 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 lot of violence uh, after the coup on February 1st. But the people who are showing up for these protests with these three-finger salute all tend to be college graduates. You know, I've seen many of the interviews that they do on uh, television, many of their writings. And this is an aspirational class uh, that has come up in the last 10 years. And you know they want to participate fully in the benefits of a growing economy and feel that politics 
is getting in the way. And th- this is really a common thread in Myanmar, Thailand, and uh, Hong Kong. So if you're not able to gainfully employ college graduates, and this is taking place against the backdrop of technological disruption, and, and I do accept the point that, you know, uh, uh, all the worries that we have about automation, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, taking over our lives, taking over our jobs, will not materialize uh, in the same dramatic fashion. But at the same time, if Asia is not, ab- not able to grow uh, because the export engine is stalling, and we need to figure out how do we employ all of these smart young graduates. So, you know, deglobalization and technological disruption taken together and, and looking at Asia as a whole in the current conjecture one one does get uh, uh, worried about uh, how policymakers will be able to ensure that economic growth can be sustained uh, into the future. Climate change, I think, is a completely different uh, challenge for Asian policymakers. Uh, Asia, after all, is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases anywhere in the world. And of course, if you strip away China, uh, uh, you come to a more hopeful picture because China's emissions and India's emissions are literally off the charts. But again, we are not we are not seeing resolute action by policymakers. And I really do look at Indonesia and worry. But you know, every year, and you live in Singapore, Taimo, every year you've got this phenomenon of uh, the haze in many parts of Southeast Asia because of rampant forest fires in Borneo. And this is a problem that's easily res- resolvable, and, and you know, it can be resolved through strong policies on the ground to make sure that the palm oil plantations uh, follow sustainable practices. Certainly conditions can be placed on Indonesian banks on on whom they can lend and and under what ESG conditions. Uh, But this is not happening. So I do worry that, you know, all of this, you know, it's one thing for Asia alone to worry about deglobalization, uh, but to worry about climate change, to worry about technological disruption all at the same time maybe too much yeah it's um it's it's a big one and of course you know there's so many low-lying coastal areas that are vulnerable to global warming uh and the uh, you know from water rights to irrigable land all of those things are not just a question of tension for the local population and tech tension for uh, a prosperous future but also a huge risk of, on the geopolitical side uh, you know, I mean, that's my big worry that the 21st century would be characterized by wars over water and wars over um, uh, displaced people coming from uh, as, as climate refugees. Um, and and yeah, uh, you know, Singapore, because of its uh, resources, can make a half century or century long plan to uh, prevent its uh, land from going underwater. But uh, who else has, you know, wherewithal or fortitude like that? So no, I, I take your point. Um, now, the heart of your book, Vasuki, where you do something uh, rather outlandish, I have to say. You draw a parallel between 13th century Florence and today's Asia, and as if that is not enough, then you go and bring Dante's Divine Comedy and start drawing parallels about his various circles of hell with Asia. So for those who have not read your book yet, uh, here's your time to give them a very provocative pitch. Thank you very much for that. You know, I was introduced to Dante in high school by this incredible uh, English teacher who really looked at uh, Divine Comedy as a political tract rather than a theological tract. And I think much of Dante's poetry and philosophy is seen in theological terms. Uh, But I know I benefited from this wisdom uh, from this English teacher to really look at this as a political tract. And the more digging that you do of Florence in the 13th century, you know, prosperous, uh, globalized Florence, uh, the more parallels you see with the Asia of today. And when I was beginning to get, uh, you know, my initial thesis of the book was a little bit more hopeful, but then I had this uh, chastening experience, uh, which I write in the book with this auto rickshaw driver in Mumbai, Pramod who essentially challenged me in that 20 minute auto rickshaw ride. He essentially challenged me and said that all of this talk about India growing economically 
uh, was well and good for someone like me, you know, who who he described as you know living in heaven, and he said that his own living conditions uh, uh, was you know living in hell, and I linked that up with Dante, and and really got the sense that you know Asia indeed, developing Asia I must add, is uh, 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 living through eight circles of hell, and then I go on to describe what these circles of hell are, and then the pandemic happened. And if you go back again to 13th century, so Dante passed away in 1321, uh, very disillusioned from whatever accounts uh, one can read, mainly because he was banished uh, from Florence because of a political struggle uh, with the Pope at the time. And and there was much bitterness in his writings about uh, politics, about inequality uh, that prompted, prompted him to write uh, Divine Comedy. So 26 years after Dante passed away, and this is the late Middle Ages in Europe, uh, the bubonic plague happens. And this is a plague uh, uh, which went on for four years. We don't have hard data on on how many people died. Most estimates suggest 200 million, 300 million. And you've got this really, really dramatic account of the plague coming through ships. Uh, And and, and I really commend this is an article I refer to in the book uh, that was written after the pandemic. And uh, the interesting link that one can draw between 13th century Florence and the Asia of today is I see Asia being on the cusp of another Renaissance. And what the plague did to Florence in 1347 is really, you know, it opened up eyes, it opened up minds. And, and that saw a period of flourishing under the European Renaissance uh, for many centuries after that. I think Asia has an opportunity today uh, with the pandemic to reset political, economic, and social priorities and, and really ensure that uh, Dante's worst predictions don't come true. Fair enough. But Vasuki, we'll talk about leadership later because I think to make sure that vision does not come true, you'll need progressive leadership. But before we get there, uh, I just want to quickly summarize your eight circles of health. One is, of course, you know, the demographic headwind from aging, and there's the middle income trap, climate change, gender, internal insurgencies, fragile geopolitics, uh, the, the aspirational people without job prospects, and then oligarchy. Um, we cannot conceivably go over all of them. So we'll let the readers delve into most of them, but I am really intrigued by your concern over the region's monopolies and oligopolies. Now, Masuki, haven't they always been around, even those 30, 40 years when Asia's fantastic growth took place? Wasn't it despite or perhaps even because of those oligarchies? So why will they hold back the region now? Yeah, oligarchies have absolutely been around for a long, long period of time. And, you know, the proposition I make in the book is Asia is getting chabolized, that you've got this handful of companies in Korea who have really managed to concentrate economic power and political power for 50, 60 years. And pretty much the same thing is beginning to happen in the rest of Asia. But there, there is one, I think, big difference between the billionaires of the past and the billionaires of today. And, and really that is concentration, even amongst the billionaire class, there is a concentration of a handful of them who are very closely aligned uh, with the political uh, leaders in many of these countries. And it is this collaboration, it is this nexus uh, that, that I think is very different. I, I don't want to mention any names. I mean, if you look at India, if you look at Indonesia and many parts of Asia, You've got a handful of billionaires who really are in incredible positions of power today, who seem to be completely aligned with uh, uh, political masters. And the point that I make in the book is when the interests of the billionaire class and the political class are aligned, it's not clear uh, if the public interest is being served. So that's really the difference, I think, between the ABCs, you know, this is the Asian billionaire class, as I describe in the book, compared with any other period. And, you know, we should reflect on the fact, and I've just seen the latest uh, Forbes list of Asian billionaires. There are 1,149 billionaires from Asia. I mean, there's nothing wrong uh, with having such a large, startling number of, of billionaires. Uh, but you've got to reflect a little bit and think, 
is this an appropriate size for a low-income country and a middle-income country? Is there something wrong with public policy? But the incentive structure for to become a billionaire seems to be an easier path compared with those who are struggling lower down the economic ladder. And we need a great deal of pub, you know, public debate on this. And that public debate, unfortunately, is being stifled in many parts of Asia today. Yeah, I think that's uh, spot on. I think this alignment of the interest yeah. of the uh, oligarch class and the ruling class is certainly not something that you want. Uh, there has to be some checks and balances. And I think in the West in particular, I think we are beginning to see the pendulum swing the other direction. Uh, and hopefully some of that positive spillover will come our way as well. And related to that issue, uh, Vasuki is, uh, and we just touched on this thing, uh, the need for progressive leadership. And you lament that you know there's a dearth of that, uh, especially given the recent developments that we're seeing in the region. Um, any countries out there where you find the leadership equipped for the right vision? Yeah, I'm, I think first, uh, the two ways of answering this question. One is uh, uh, to answer your question on whether there are any leaders out there with the right vision, or you know, you could you could look at it differently and say, are there countries in Asia today where political renewal is possible? And and coming to that, I think Indonesia is a very good example where political renewal is possible, that you're beginning to see leadership emerge uh, uh, from most unexpected quarters in the country, right? So I think President Jokowi himself, uh, I mean, he conducted the most daring act of political entre entrepreneurship anywhere in Asia in the last five, six decades. Because he literally came out of nowhere. He's got this homespun political philosophy he connects very well with people. He's, he's you know, in many respects, uh, uh, similarities between Barack Obama and Jokowi. And if you go down and meet with uh, provincial leaders in Indonesia, you're beginning to re realize that a lot of the professional class are now, now consider politics uh, to be a serious, viable alternative as a profession. And I think that is good news. I mean, the unfortunate aspect of Indonesian politics, you know, as as the yeah, as happens elsewhere, is you're beginning to see dynastic succession, uh, and, and that that is a worrying sign. And I always wonder that you know if you can be 30 years old in Asia today and set up an Alibaba, or a Flipkart, or a Gojek, uh, but you probably have to be 65 or 70 years old uh, before you before you're given an opportunity to run the country. So there is that disconnect. And if you look at the demographic bulge in India and Indonesia, if you look at the fact that almost every leader in, in Asia today was born in the radio and telegraph era. So <laughs> there is that mismatch. And, and, and the fact that, you know, that this, this, I mean, all of these political leaders are savvy on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, but we should not really be fooled by the savviness uh, with social media. And, and ask the question, do, do they connect well with younger people? Do they speak to the aspirations and concerns of these younger people in, in many of these countries? And the answer is probably no. So I think Asia needs political renewal and political renewal of the kind uh, 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 that we've seen with the rise of Alibaba, Tencent and other unicorns across the region. Yeah, Vasuki, big gap between being savvy and being progressive or being enlightened. I think in the last few years, in the plethora of fake news around the world, we have seen that tech mastery does not make you necessarily the right kind of person to guide society. Uh, no, your point is very well taken. Um, I, I've noticed that, you know, through this conversation, I've tried to sort of push you on your negative perspectives and you have sort of countered very nicely with a very balanced response. So I think in your heart, you still are an optimist for Asia, but I think you want a clear-headed approach toward the coming challenges, and that is very well appreciated. So where does Asia go from here, Vasuki? I think where Asia goes from here is it's going to recover from the pandemic. And I think if we go down in history, pandemics, natural disasters, economic crisis, do, have, do leave long-term impacts on, on society. And you know it's very very difficult to predict uh, uh, which way Asia goes. And I think you know 
I don't want to get into the forecasters business <laughs> of saying that in five or 10 years, things are going to return uh, to normal in Asia. But I think two genies that have been released from the bottle, uh, which did not exist before, one, uh, really the college educated are becoming very, very politically savvy. They're very committed about social issues. And this is, this is something that we need to really keep a close eye out on. Uh, the old thing about Asia was, you know, as long as there was economic growth and as long as people had jobs, they would not worry about politics. And this is simply, simply untrue, as we've discovered in Hong Kong and, and in Thailand. So this is something that I really need to uh, worry about. The second thing really is on climate change. And, and until and unless climate change begins to have an impact on Main Street, where, where it is ordinary people who begin to demand uh, that their political masters uh, uh, redefine, develop a climate change plan. Uh, so these are, you take these two factors together, and I think that's enough to fill the inbox of Asian policymakers for the next five to 10 years. I'm not reflecting on growth. I believe growth is just going to remain strong, uh, but I do worry about social mobility. And any evidence that I begin to see of policymakers addressing all of these challenges, I think that is going to place uh, Asia on a very, very good path uh, moving forward. So yes, I'm an optimist, but I've been somewhat frustrated over the last five years with the misdirection of many of our policymakers. Right, and as you say toward the end of your book that you began conceptualizing this book with a far more positive disposition than the process of writing the book and traveling and talking to the promos of the world, which made you a far more, a far less sanguine about the outlook. I only wish that, you know, these sort of realism becomes embedded in not just among policymakers, Vasuki, but also among thinkers, civil society leaders, because it's not just about thinking from the top, but you need realism even at the middle and bottom part of the society. So uh, I wish you very good luck with the book. Uh, lots of people should read it and uh, good luck. I mean, I don't think thanks to COVID, you're gonna do much of a book tour, but you will be doing some virtual travel, I'm sure. Yes, thank you very much, Simon, for the time. Absolutely uh, uh, enjoyable conversation with you. And yes, I'm spending much of my time on Zoom or Doom as people call it. <laughs> That's where you are. <laughs> Uh, so I wish you the very best of luck, Vasuki. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to our listeners. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Taki. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 51 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Group Research. Have a great day.